So there I am with my family on our way to the Museum of Science and Industry on Pi Day, March 14th. Now, as all of you know, Pi is an irrational number that starts off at 3.14159265365. Now, this happened to be the year 2015, which would give me Pi to five digits. It's a one in a century event. I'm super excited, as are all of you, right? <laughs> exactly. So I look at the next three digits, 926. The Museum of Science and Industry opens at 930. So for sure, I'm thinking they're going to open up a few minutes early. And in fact, the next two digits are 53. So all they have to do is open up the museum three minutes and seven seconds early so that I can have pi to 10 digits. Super exciting for me. I am brutally rebuffed. <laughs> so my only hope is that one of my kids will go back in 96 years and write this wrong that was done to me. <laughs> now, some people think I take statistics a little bit too seriously, and maybe I do. But this talk is going to be about how we can use numbers and data to improve the trajectory of your life. So we all know that life is a journey and not a destination, right? But of course, if you're on a journey and you have no destination, the definition is you're lost. So we're going to talk about three ways to use data and information to make your life a better life. Now, you all know I like pi, both kinds, actually. So what's really interesting to me is not the way that irrational numbers act, but the way that people act towards numbers irrationally. So let's think about this. If I were to offer you a proposition, let's go skydiving once a month this year, or get in a car and drive 10,000 miles, which would you think is safer? Which feels safer? The car, of course. And we have no problem getting in an Uber with a stranger, but jumping out of an airplane somehow makes us nervous. But the reality is, jumping out of an airplane is twice as safe as getting in a car. Now, there's all sorts of other aspects or characteristics that we can think about. Now, nobody here in the college world has actually lived a life without terrorism in our world. It's in our lexicon. It changes and affects our decisions. But are we making rational decisions around the numbers? OK, so which is more dangerous, a terrorist who's trying to kill you or a doctor who's trying to help you? A doctor is 6,000 times more likely to kill you than a terrorist. Amazing, right? You are much more of a danger to yourself. You're 4,700 times more likely to drink yourself to death. Or doing something dumb? 350 times more likely to kill yourself that way. And zombie parasites that are going to eat your brains, which you probably never even thought of, 22 times more likely to kill you than a terrorist. Now, what about this? When I was growing up, there was an entire generation scared of the water because of a movie called Jaws. And as far as I know, there was never a movie called Moo, but cows are 20 times more likely to kill you. <laughs> An asteroid falling from the sky, 2.7 times. Champagne corks, hyper deadly, 24 times likely to kill you. You, again, are your own worst enemy, 6,000 times more likely to die from tripping. Killer vending machines. And I'm not even talking about what's on the inside. Two times more likely to die from them just falling on top of you, even though they're not moving. And then your safe space, your bed. You're 450 times more likely to die by falling out of bed. So what does this tell us? Don't go to the doctor? Be afraid of bringing, eating zombie parasites now? No. What this says is we have evolved with biases. We all have them. There's no way around them. Okay. It leads us to make irrational decisions. We think we're being rational, and we're making weird choices. And I'm going to talk to you about one smart man said, making these rational decisions early in your life makes all the difference. Now, I manage risk and reward for my clients for a living. That's what I do. So I want to talk about an example that's near and dear to my heart, investing. And you should all be saving for retirement. Not nearly enough of you guys do. That's my commercial. Now, if you were to save, and scrimp together $100 a month every single month until you retire. And yet, you, let's say you went a Lollapalooza ticket like you all did today, congratulations. Or you decided to give up a night of drinking. And you were able to scrape together that $100 a month. And you invested at a rate that underperformed the stock market by 1%. Not that much, just 1% a year. You would still end up with half a million dollars in your retirement account. Good for you. It's not bad, right? 
But if you made incrementally better choices and decisions over the course of your life, and you just made that 1% adjustment, and you outperformed by 1%, you would end up with over a million dollars in your retirement account. That 1% swing makes a humongous difference. And that's what we're going to focus on today, making small adjustments in your world so that you can make a better, better choices along the way. OK, so we talked about three ways that we're going to improve our life. Number one, have a plan for your destination. Why should you have a plan? Well, Harvard did a study. And they said, hey, grad students, you guys have been looking at business plans for the last two years. You've been writing them, evaluating how many of you made a business plan for the most important venture that you're ever going to have your own life. And what they found was only 3% had a written out business plan of how they're going to achieve their goals. You know, but the other 97%, they're from Harvard. They're probably going to do OK, right? So we went and checked on them. And what we found out was 10 years later, the 3 percenters had amassed 10 times the wealth that the other 97% did combined. That means, on average, each 3 percenter made 300 times more money than the other 97% from Harvard. So these guys are doing a pretty good job, right? Map out your destination and your plan. Number two, game theory your journey. And what do I mean by game theory? So game theory is more than just what's your strategy going to be at Fortnite tonight. Super important. Now, the definition of game theory is very similar. It's a multiplayer system where you don't know what your opponents are going to do, but yet you're trying to optimize your own outcome. All right? Now, game theory has been used in all sorts of aspects of life, like war, politics, finance, romance, Game of Thrones, you know, the most important things out there. The most famous example of game theory is called the prisoner's dilemma. I'm going to walk you through this so you can understand what it's about. The prisoner's dilemma is this. Let's say you and your buddy decide that you need to rob a jewelry store because you don't want to give up a night of drinking and you want to fund your retirement account. Super important to you. So you rob a jewelry store, but you get caught because you know crime doesn't pay, of course. And you get taken back to the police station, and the police station, the detective says to you, we got you for trespassing. You and your buddy, you're each going to get a year of jail time. But if you confess and you tell me that it was your buddy's idea, then he's going to get 20 years and you're going to get to go free because we're going to get him on more stuff. But we're going to give him the same option. And if you both confess, then since we have you on bigger charges, you're both going to get five years. And then he leaves the room. So clearly, the best option is for you both to remain silent, for you both to get your one year, correct? But you're in that room by yourself, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's my buddy going to do? I don't know. So you start thinking about it. Well, if he confesses, I have two options, confess or not confess. If he confesses and I confess, I get five years. If I remain silent, I get 20. Better for me to confess. All right, let's look at the other one. If he remains silent, and I remain silent, I go free. I mean, I'm sorry, I get one year. But if I confess, then I go free. So no matter what my buddy does, it seems to be better for me to confess. But even more so, my buddy's thinking the same thing. He doesn't know what I'm going to do, so he's thinking it's better for him to confess. This is called a Nash equilibrium. The optimal solution is for us to remain silent and for us to both get one year. But either one of us can improve our position by confessing. So we ultimately confess. Now, what does this teach us about life? Well, if you need to fund your retirement account and you're robbing a jewelry store and you get caught, zip it. <laughs> Think about this. Is anybody going to commit a crime later today? No? OK, I hope not. So you're not committing a crime, but we all know from crime dramas that we need to be quiet. We need to silence. We can't rat on our buddy. It's the worst thing to do. The organized crime has seen this prisoner's dilemma, and they've game theory prisoner's dilemma. And they said, we need to take that confession option off the table. They have looked at the scenario and said, they're driven towards the confession. So we need to drive them back to the unstable, keep quiet event. So what that means is, ahead of time, 
You need to decide the philosophy for your life. How are you going to act in your life when you are presented with situations that might drive you to an unstable and un, unoptimal position? Okay. So first, in order to do that, you need to understand what some of these biases are. Now, they have weird names, like loss aversion, and framing, and herd mentality. I mean, it's twice these cows are super dangerous, right? So now we're going to talk about one thing, loss aversion. So if I were to place a bet with you on a coin toss, and I said, I got $1,000, and I'm going to bet you $1,000 on a coin toss, you bring out your 1000 I bring out mine. Winner takes all. You win, you get my $1,000. You lose, you lose your 1000 Who takes the bet? Probably nobody. OK, that's what the rules say. That's what the research says. Nobody takes the bet. Now, I did have a client once that said, I'll take the bet. And I happened to have just robbed a jewelry store. And I put out my $1,000. And I said, OK, let's do it. I mean, it wasn't my money, right? So let's do it. And he said, whoa, I didn't know you were serious. I said, I am serious. And stop messing up my example, because nobody takes this bet. So what if I were to up it to $1,001 on a coin toss? Again, that's probably not enough. The reason why is you have loss aversion. That means the pain you feel from the loss is much greater than the pleasure you feel from the upside gain of an equal amount. So I have to keep upping my ante. 1100 probably not. 1500 probably some people in the audience are starting to say, it starts to make sense to me. And when I get to about 2000 that's what the research says it makes sense. A 2 to 1 risk reward ratio where I'm going to take on this bet of a coin toss of whether you lose your 1000 or gain $2,000. But is that the right method for you? Is that the right philosophy for you? You're being ruled by biases and fear. I would argue you should be ruled by numbers. So let's look at it a different way, something called expected value. For your engineers in the room, you probably know what that is. But I'm going to talk about expected value in a little bit different way. You and your buddy who robbed the jewelry store, you served your time, you're out, and you're working for a company. I happen to be the CEO. All of you are presidents of a division within the company. And instead of a $1,000 bet, you're faced with a million dollar bet. You're going to bet a million dollars of the company's money on a project. 50-50 chance. If your project fails, you lose a million dollars. If the project succeeds, you make 1.1 million. Now, loss aversion would suggest, I don't want to rock the boat. It's not worth the risk to me. But I'm the CEO here. And what do I want as a CEO? I want you to all take the bet. Why? Let's look at it this way. It's a 50-50 shot. You and your buddy have this opportunity to invest a million dollars. And let's say it's based off a coin flip. One of you have heads, one of you has tails. For sure, one of you is going to win, and one of you is going to lose in this project. For sure, one of you will make a million and one dollar, a million point one dollars, and one of you will lose a million dollars. So together, you make a hundred thousand dollars. You split the money. And that's a $50,000 gain. So expected value is what is the outcome of each individual trial? What do you expect the outcome to be over the long-term averages? And in this example, it's $50,000. So if I look out in the room and have 100 people in the room with expected value of $50,000, that's $5 million of profit to the company. Moments before, when you were looking at loss aversion, you didn't want to take it. Now, if, with expected value on your mind, me as the CEO, I want all of you to take it. Now, what does that mean? Well, you should take opportunities and chances where expected value is positive. Because as Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots that, wait, not those shots. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. OK? So what is it, how does this apply to you guys? I am not the CEO of your company. But you are the CEO of your own life. And today, you're going to make 35,000 choices today. Some of them are going to revolve around food, maybe not that important. But over your course of your life, you will make 52 billion decisions. That's a lot of decisions. And if I said to you, here comes a one in a million decision that you have, that means you have 52,000 one in a million decisions facing you. Maybe it's going to be 
some crazy guy offers you a bet of $1,500 versus $1,000. Should I take it? Maybe it's a company project. But you have 52,000 decisions in which you are the CEO of your life, and you need to make the decisions based off of fear and biases or based off of numbers. So as one of my idols said, I can accept failure. I cannot accept not trying. So in our household, we tried to regain loss aversion and um, expected value by defining failure as a learning event and not trying as failure. So we tried to take the, the failure part or the not trying part off the table for our kids. Now, I don't know what the future is going to hold for you. I don't know how the future is going to evolve. But I do know that if you build your philosophy today to act with numbers as opposed to fear and biases, that you'll make better choices and decisions along the way. And the research says that you'll be more fulfilled and more successful. So pregame your life today. Define your destination. Game theory your journey in your life, and not just the games you play. And use numbers and information to overcome your biases and risks. Another study that said, if you have a viewpoint, and you're presented with data that's opposite of that viewpoint, most people, not you guys, of course, but most people will shun the data and become more entrenched in a viewpoint that they just found out was more likely to be wrong. What is your philosophy going to be with your life? Are you going to be ruled by fear and biases? Or are you going to use number and data to make better decisions so that your journey and your destination can be epic? Thank you so much for your time.